Hey guys, welcome back to our Road Through Romans. We're in episode number six, and today uh, we're going to try to cover verses uh, in chapter two, verses 17 through 29. So let's do a quick snapshot. In the first major section of the book of Romans, that is uh, chapter one, verse 18 through chapter three, Paul makes a convincing case that everybody has sinned, where we've all messed up, everybody needs forgiveness, everyone needs salvation. But in these first couple of chapters, he identifies very specifically three categories of people who, in fact, have sinned. First, he talks about the rebellious. That's in that chapter one section where it goes through the progression of sin. Then he moves into the respectables, <laughs> and that's where he talks about, you know, the Jews are like, oh, we're not all that, and we're so good, and we're so good. And we talked about that last time, and then today what we're going to look at is uh, the, the religious, and that's, the, that's what he's going to cover. Verse 17 through 29, he kind of jumps into this category of people who are highly religious. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, let me give you a quick definition of religion. Religion is man's attempt to, uh, to reach to God. Mm -hmm. it's, it's when we attempt some system of rules or processes or whatever it is, but some system whereby we can work our way to God, to being right or to being uh, pure or holy or, or uh, moving from us to God. So religion is the, is the issue that he's going to deal with, and in our context, most specifically, Judaism. Now, the fact is, uh, two things I want you to know about religious people. First, Religious people are the hardest people to reach for Christ. It is so hard to reach someone for Jesus yeah. Christ who thinks they're already there. Would you agree with yeah, that? Yeah. I mean, it, it is so difficult because, man, it's like, oh, yeah, I'm good. I've got to you know, cross all my T's and dot my... And, and, and the second uh, problem with religious folks is that they make it harder for all the rest of us mm -hmm. because the number one reason that young people do not convert their faith into the adulthood and church membership is because hypocrisy. It is the religious hypocrites that they grew up around seeing somebody who talked one thing but lived another. In fact, two-thirds of teenagers, according to research, shows that they will leave the church when they turn 18. So we found at Oak Ridge that actually it's, they don't wait to 18, they wait till car. Yeah. You know, <laughs> once they're mobile, you know, yeah. then, then it's like, I got a choice and I don't have to come. And so uh, our whole family ministry uh, is really centered around looking at ways uh, to really combat that. Yeah. In the Wednesday night equip program yep. that you're doing, we talked about this once before, but if your teenager's not uh, in equip, you can just go ahead and say, hey, uh, see ya, because you, you probably won't keep your faith. You know, yeah. at the end of the day, they got to know how to defend yep. their their the, biblical faith. The equip is designed to be this place where when they show up, they're going to get to rub shoulders with with people who are not hypocrites, right? Yeah. So so if for the duration of their church experience they never have, but that one person, he's the real deal, right? Yeah. And, and and then that person took time to pour into their life and invest in them, and the, so later on they can go. Well, you know, at least that was real. Maybe that's worth going back to. And then the other thing is, how can I? How can we leverage this time of equipping these students to get them fully connected into the church and, and make them the, the leaders of now within our church, right? The opportunity to, to yeah. step into positions where they're like, yeah, I, I'm running this soundboard and uh, I'm leading these uh, elementary school kids and yeah. and I have they need me here. Yeah, they have a... Uh, because because I'm the one who helps pull this thing yeah. off and, and what I do is real. And so now my faith has to be real because of what I have to now get. And so Equip is all about putting a real role model in front of them, but also giving them a real role themselves and helping them along, along those ways. So it's pretty cool. Pretty That's cool the title. Yeah. Equip, it's a fact. Yep. We work very clever. <laughs> Greatest ministries are very, <laughs> very precise in what they are. Well, and it's so critical that they understand, first of all, how to defend their faith. That is, how do I... How do I tell, you know, what's true and what's real and what's legitimate? That's one. But then secondly, that they have a real role in the church. Mm -hmm. So thank you for what you're doing and every volunteer that's helping out with our young people. Uh, thank you for what you do. It makes a difference. Yeah. So Paul is going to talk about these, uh, these religious folk. And so I want to look through in these verses, verse by verse, the eight characteristics of a religious person. Here's the first one. Verse 17, he says, uh, they depend on a label. It says, in fact, if you call yourself a Jew, circle or highlight in your mind that word, call. <laughs> in other words, uh, you, you, you think of yourself first and foremost through that lens 
of the religious lens. Well, this is who I am. This is my label. And the fact is, we have a lot of, lot of people who depend upon those labels. Like if you were to ask someone, are you a believer and a follower of Jesus Christ? They say, oh, of course I am. I'm, I'm Baptist. <laughs> or I'm, I'm Methodist, or I'm Catholic, or, or you just fill in the list. In other words, they're depending upon some denominational hook to identify themselves with their Christianity. Can I just tell you, uh, there's a vast difference between uh, a religious label and, and knowing Jesus. <laughs> they're not the same. And by the way, sometimes we use uh, not just a label of uh, like a denomination, but sometimes it's a label of like an action, you know, oh yeah, are you a Christian? Oh yeah, I got baptized. Okay, well, uh, can I be honest with you? That may or may not have anything to do with whether you're a believer. And, and the fact is, even if you were baptized at Oak Ridge, I'm still kind of like, I, I, okay, you know, I, I want to know, have you had a, an encounter with Christ that left you different? Yeah. Ha have, you, have you had an encounter with Jesus? Because if you met Jesus, but you didn't come away different, you m might want to double check. <laughs> Number two, he says they rely on rules and regulations. Notice he says in the f second half of that verse, you rely on the law. Now, mm -hmm. now that word law, uh, if you went to Bible overview, we covered this sense of that refers to the first five books uh, of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, and Numbers. And it has to do with uh, what Jews would call the Torah. Uh, we call it the Pentateuch. Uh, now, for many of us, we would think of, you know, the law, and we think of Ten Commandments, right? You know, and that's, you know, I shouldn't steal and kill and all those kind of things. But, but for an Orthodox Jew, that equivocates with 613 commandments, explicit. 613 commandments that they got to keep up with and that they got to know that they don't break or mess up in. And not only that, they had all the rabbis for generations that were writing on, well, can I do this but not this? Yeah, <laughs> and yeah. so all the rabbis, they write these commentaries, we call them yeah. the Targum, and, and they write and say, well, you know, this is how you might uh, break the Sabbath. So for example, the Sabbath alone, you're only talking one commandment, mm. honor, honor the Sabbath, only one of the 613, but of the commandment, the rabbis have written 39 categories of how you can mess us up. <laughs> yeah. there's, one, the, there's one that says tanning. Does that mean I can't tanning, go to the tanning, yes, I can't go to the tanning bed? Yes. Is that spray, that but is the spray on, is <laughs> yeah, that an no, exception? No, no, you've broke the command. You have broken the uh -oh. Sabbath. Yeah. You can't tan, threshing, threshing, winnowing, selecting, sifting, grinding, and, and that means all forms, kneading, <laughs> combining. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. And so you think about, here's the thing, think about the powerful mm. delusion when I'm getting it all right. Mm -hmm. like if, I, if I'm keeping yeah. every rule. Well, well, we don't have to imagine that. There was a dude that came to Jesus. He was called the rich young ruler, often as a subtext. And that guy comes to Jesus and he says, Master, tell me, what, what do I have to do to be totally right with God? Jesus said, obey the commandments. Now he's testing him. For us, we think that's a quip, you know, it's just like, oh yeah, do, you know, do nice things. Mm -hmm. But this guy says, I have. Now I want you to listen to me. Yeah. He said, I have, but I still don't have eternal life. That ought to tell you something. Because you can be the maximum religious person and not have Jesus. Yeah. So knowing the difference yeah. between and them. He, he felt that and internalized that or else he wouldn't have come asking this question. Yeah. So, yeah. so many, so many, and That's this is point. what you see in all these other religions is they have all these practices and yeah. all these rules, but there's never this sense of absolute security of I'm definitely in the family. Yeah. There's, there's always, well, I, I hope I did good enough. Still mm -hmm. empty. Still yeah. empty. We had a guy in our church in Tulsa who had been on staff with a church for years and years and years serving on the staff who gave his life to Christ in a revival meeting mm. at that church. I mean, he literally came forward, gave his life to Christ, and he said, wow. you know what? I've been religious since the time, I, he said, I was born in the nursery, and I grew <laughs> yeah. up in the church. I've never not been in the church. I've been around this. He said, but I, never, I didn't have what the preacher was talking about, yeah. mm -hmm. and, and I gave my life to Christ. So, so Brian, carry on with what, what the, these eight characteristics. Yeah, number three, they think they have a special status with God. And, of course, that's what the Jews thought, you know. Everything was, hey, we're children of Abraham. Uh, Romans 2.17 says, in boasting God, you know, they're, they're always boasting on who they are, I think, as it relates, relates to God, you know. And that's, um, 
you know, we think about this a lot, you know, there's some church, I was part of a certain church that, you know, we had the special anointing, you know, yeah. only the, only the Holy Spirit was moving yeah. in our church, mm -hmm. you know, and, <laughs> and you should come get some of this because we have a special connection and a special status with God, you know, they're in, everyone else is out, you know, there's even, hey, unless you're baptized with the Holy Spirit, which is something secondary yeah. Yeah. Of, of, of faith in Christ and committing your life to Christ, you're really not saved, you know, and it's just yeah. this, I heard it like this, you know, they're so heavenly minded, they're no earthly goods, right. right? You know, some of these people that, and I was that person one time, you know, you just think, you know, and you look good, you dress up, you got your tie, and, um, and, and I have a special connection with God because of who I am, you know, and the things that God's doing in my life. The fourth, uh, they claim to have a pipeline to God. Paul says this in Romans 2.18, if you know his will and approve of what is superior, and you know, and Paul's kind of being sarcastic here, you know, and uh, religious people think they have a special knowledge, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, with God. They understand the text more than me and you could ever understand it. Mm -hmm. You know, they, uh, they're just not being led by the Spirit, or you're not being led by the Spirit enough, and I can hear from God in a way uh, that you can. You know, that's the kind of thinking that they have, that they have this special knowledge or our understanding. Now, if, they're, if they're in the South, it's, if you read the Bible, they say, now bless your heart. But, yeah. <laughs> you know, I'll yeah. tell you what that means. Yeah, let me really <laughs> tell you what that means. You're missing the point here, yeah. you know, and I think, and that, you know, and again, these are the things that continue to push people away, as you said, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, if that's what Jesus is like, I don't know if I want any of that, right? Yep. And then the, the fifth, they maintain a high moral standard mm. uh, because you're instructed by the law. Religious people think that, that being good uh, makes me good. You know, if I do the right things, you know, oftentimes, um, you know, in this job, you get to ask people, you know, hey, or I used to ask the, the EE questions, you know, right. if, if, which if you ever heard is, you know, hey, uh, if you know you were going to die today, well, yeah. you know you get to heaven. Yeah, okay, well, if you got to the gate, you know, how do you, how do you know? And God asks you, how could you get in? What would your answer be? And, 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 you know, most of the people that I've asked those questions to that are in the church say, well, I think I'm a good person. You know, I, mm. I hold the doors, I serve, you know, mm -hmm. it, it's, it, they're good people. So if God's good, then he would accept me, yeah. you know, and uh, um, I think that's a, you know, a big thing that they do. They're Sabbath keepers, they keep Sunday, they don't work, they fast, uh, they're in all the Bible studies, they're journaling, you know, and, I, you know, I used to get on my nerves so much when I was forced <laughs> to journal, like... <laughs> Why is that a prerequisite? <laughs> like, you're not going to be... Jesus yeah. journaled. I mean, uh, Yeah, not, he it, pulled it, his scroll <laughs> out, you know, and he would journal real quick, you know, yeah. and it's like, yeah. but... Peter, James, don't bother me. I'm journaling. I'm yeah, journaling. Yeah, yeah. But right, honestly, yeah. man, I was in this, you know, this holiness movement. I've yeah. been in all, to, all the unhealthy movements I've yeah. been in. This is why I think I, I know not what to do. But it was like, if you didn't journal, you really weren't saved, you yeah. know? And so they, they do all these things to keep this high moral standard and that here's the problem yeah. with all these things especially that one is it's a, it's it's false yeah, <laughs> you know yeah. it, it's a false sense of security and i think that's why they do it yeah. it's so. false but powerful yeah yeah because honestly when you meet these people i at least this is because i've been around a lot of these folks in the church i always walk away feeling worse about myself yeah, right. yes i walk away and i'm like man i i really suck yeah. I mean, yeah. Because yeah. these people, they are amazing. I'll never forget this one time. This was the first week that uh, I, I, I came into a church. Love the local church, so don't hear anything I'm saying. It's the people that sometimes get on our nerves, right? <laughs> okay. Uh, went in, and, and I was having a conversation with someone, and they were selling their house. And I said, man, I said, well, well good luck with that. Well, brother, we don't believe, you know, oh, well, yeah. brother, we don't believe in luck. That's and, you right. know, man, I was, I was uh, crushed. I was yeah. like, I will never say anything else again in this church. Yeah. You know, it's like, yeah. I was like, I mean, I get the heart of what they were saying, but Bless it's like, your heart. yeah, you know. And the thing about what, the thing about a lot of these things, the fasting, Bible studies, praying, all these, they're not bad things. Yeah. They're, they're no. the disciplines we all want to try to do. But, but when you don't do it for the right reason and you do it for such extreme, and then you think about how are you making other people feel based on how much you do it. Like, I, I would talk with people, and I'd be like, oh, that blessed hour of prayer. And I'm like, a whole hour? Of but it's, it's, it's sweet hour. It is it's sweet. I totally sweet. got it wrong. It's it is sweet the sweet hour, hour of prayer. Your heart. Yeah. You, but, <laughs> like, that's amazing. If you can do it, yeah. that's a great thing. Do it. Oh, yeah. But I, I was never more freed in my life than when I realized that's not a prerequisite. Like, you haven't suddenly arrived when you're able to, to spend hours and hours and hours yeah. in prayer. 
you know. Well, even if you prayed for a full hour, but you didn't do it at 4 a.m. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly. Yeah. Yeah, that don't count. That's exactly. yeah, you don't have to sacrifice yeah. nothing. And I think the easy way to tell about this, like you said, all none of this stuff is bad. That's is right. It, is it puffing me up? Yeah, that's right. You know, is it, what, what was, that's you know, when Jesus like, so am, I, am I pounding my chest of how good I am and this person, yep. you know, as Jesus said, is bad, you yep. know, and. Uh, you know, that uh, actually leads us to number yeah. six. If you look at here at number, number six, for uh, for how these these religious folks act is they, they have a condescending attitude mm, towards others, yeah. and uh, Paul doesn't pull any punches. If you look at nineteen and twenty, he says, "If you are convinced that you're a guide, I love it how you're convinced you're a guide, <laughs> yeah, yeah. right? <laughs> for the blind, or you're convinced you're a light for those who are in the dark, or you're convinced you're an instructor for the foolish, or if you're convinced you're a teacher." of little children mm. because you have the law and the embodiment of knowledge and truth. And it's just, it's, he's sitting here like, yeah, probably if you feel that superior to everybody, and you're like, oh, you're such a cute little child. I know you're 40, but let me tell you what you, you know, how you need to go. Yeah, and it's yeah. from this position of superiority. Um, and, and, and if you view sinners, folks who aren't saved yet, and you're looking down your nose at them, what in the world, right? How are you supposed to win them if that's your attitude towards them? So religious yeah. people, uh, condescending attitude. Number seven, um, the seventh attitude, they don't always practice what they preach. Whoa. They don't always practice what, surprise, right? <laughs> really? That was that's a so big, shocking. big surprise when he said that. Look, it says in um, Romans 2.21, you then who teach others, do you not teach yourself? You who preach against stealing, do you steal? You who say that people should not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law, do you not dishonor God by breaking the law? Yeah, these religious people, self-examination is not like the top of their no, list. No. It's always like looking at what everybody else is doing, um, thinking about how they can better, you know, guide those people, you know, and and you know, they just don't they just don't practice what they preach. But look what they do do. Um they, they teach, right? Do you teach others? Or do you preach against stealings? Or, or do you say that people should not commit adultery? Or do you boast in the law? All these things are centered around what's coming out of their mouth. Yeah. yeah. Right? It's, <laughs> yeah. it's like, this is what they do. Well, this is, this is God's response to this in Isaiah 29. Mm -hmm. You can see the Lord says, these people come near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Mm -hmm. Their worship of me is based merely on human rules they have been taught. Man, there's a whole the, the whole story of Israel, right, about how detestable this idea is uh, over and over and over again. So there's tons of, uh, of places where God says, this is not what I want. Yeah. And there's also a ton of negative effects associated with it because here's the deal, y'all. People go to hell because of this kind of stuff. Yeah, it's not just it's, inconvenient. Yeah, it, it's, it, he says in 24, he says, here's the deal. God's name is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you, Wow. these people. So because of the picture of how religious people live their life and treat other people and, and hold themselves up, the picture of who God is that yeah. the Gentiles, the people who are not Jewish and religious, receive, it's so wrong that they actually are committing blasphemy, right, in their understanding of who God is. Well, this is like the ultimate sin. Yeah. And so this is going to keep them separated from God. That's why we have three guiding principles here at Oak Ridge when we think about these kinds of things. One, it's, it's not our calling to make religious people. That's just, that's just not what we're here to do. Really? Um, yeah, we're not going to send you a text <laughs> reminder every morning at 4 a.m. telling you to get up to pray for an hour. We're just not going to do that around here. Just to come to church. Maybe not. to come to church. <laughs> that, that one time when we're learning out that new technology, <laughs> yeah. right? That 4 a.m. or p.m.? <laughs> oh! Yeah, uh, yeah it's, we're not trying to make religious people. We're trying to make people who have real faith, a real relationship with Jesus Christ. Yeah. And are maturing in that faith. Uh, uh, two, never expect someone to act like a Christian until they are. Uh, so often, uh, there, well, there's so many other churches are like, you got to get cleaned up before you're going to fit in here, honestly. Yeah. But that's not how we are. We're like, everybody come. Come on in. We love you. But, and that leads us to our last one, we accept people wherever they are, but we love them way too much to let them stay that yeah, way. Man, and, and then we provide opportunities for them to test the waters, get to know God, and then as God convicts their heart and as the truth is unveiled to them, we, we ask them to step up. And we allow that sanctification process to take place. So it's a cool, cool thing. Uh, number eight, religious people rely on rituals. Mm. They rely on rituals. Yeah, when you don't have the real stuff, right, when you don't have a real relationship, you have to look for something that you can point to. Right. 
You have to look. So check this out. In Romans 2, 25 through 27, it says, Circumcision has value if you observe the law. But if you break the law, you have become as though you had not been circumcised. So then, if those of you who are not circumcised keep the law's requirements, will they not be regarded as though they were circumcised? The one who is not circumcised physically and yet obeys the law will condemn you, who, even though you have been written have the written code and, uh, and circumcision are a lawbreaker. Now, let me just tell you, that is some cutting remarks oh. from Paul about circumcision. Shh. See what I did there? Yeah, that was, yeah, that was hurtful. That was, that was yeah. hurtful. That was specifically for Jim Kaler and John Lucey. <laughs> uh, but that's a mouthful there. Like, what in the world is he even talking about, right? And so circumcision was this symbol of the Jewish's unique, Jewish people's unique relationship with God, special entry into the covenant with God, and it was this sign of, I'm going to be the real deal. That, I mean, it was the seal of that covenant that I was going to be a part of. But what, what's going on is over time, it had turned into this ritual. And the reality of, of what, God, what Jesus, when he came to earth, how he redefined what it meant to be a believer, what it meant to be really in the family of God, yeah. circumcision kind of came the secondary thing. And, and he's kind of saying, look, uh, it doesn't matter if everything looks right. It doesn't matter if you've dotted all the T's, uh, dotted all the I's and crossed all the T's. It matters what's in your yeah. heart. And so... Well, it's kind of like your wedding ring. I mean, it, my wedding ring is a representation of the commitment that I've made to my wife. Right. But if I rely on the fact that, well, I've got the ring... <laughs> yeah, and that's it. But I don't live the commitment with my life, then it's yeah. worthless. That's right. And they were counting on the outward, the external stuff these rituals, these rules, the regular, yeah. you know, I like, we like to judge these poor Jews. We really do. Mm -hmm. But the truth is, I don't know any Christian who doesn't fall into the trap of saying, man, I don't feel very spiritual. I would really like to have an external. Yeah. If I can, if I can just tick a box and we've all fallen into yeah. that, you know, even with yeah. the Bible reading plan, yeah, yep. I, it's visual. I can check the boxes and I go, yeah. look, I'm 365 days right, holy. We, we'll, take, yeah. we'll take everything of that. We do every year. We do a, leader, a life development plan. Well, if I'm rocking my life development plan, I must be the stuff. <laughs> yeah. right? That's right. I mean, every time you get a tool to help you be intentional, you run the risk of taking that too far. Yeah. It doesn't mean you don't use the tool. It, it means you watch your heart more close. Like we already said, religious people never examine themselves, right? And yeah. so if we're going to use these tools effectively, we need to be examining ourselves the whole way through. Um, Paul, so, here, so here's what Paul says yeah. in Philippians 3. He says, you know, I have reasons that I could be confident of all this stuff. If somebody else thinks that they have a, a confidence, man, I have even more. I was circumcised on the eighth day. I'm a, a Jew of the tribe of Benjamin. I'm yeah. a Hebrew of Hebrews. I was a Pharisee. I had zeal. I persecuted the church. I was all this stuff. But then he says, but yet, whatever it was gain, yeah. I've counted as garbage mm -hmm. for the sake of Jesus Christ. So he's saying, look, this external stuff only has so much value. Mm -hmm. And, and at the end of the day, the only thing that actually matters is, do I have faith? And that kind of ends us because he ends, the, he ends this chapter by defining who's a real Jew. Who's the real Jew? And in verse 28 and 29, he says, a person is not a Jew who's just one outwardly. Not in circumcision, merely outward, physical. No, a person is a Jew who is one who is inwardly. inwardly and circumcision of the heart, which occurs by the Holy Spirit, not by a written code. So he's saying that's who the real Jews are. And he, that would have been so piercing to them. Yeah. Oh, oh yes. and, and similar for us today, right? You know, the, the person is perfect church attendance, to question them uh, not being a, a Christian. That'd be hard to let go. You know, yeah. That's hard to let go, to say, wait a minute. Yeah. Yep. I think it's really great that when you, in your reading this, you made sure to say by the Holy Spirit. Yeah. So like in the text, it just says Spirit, but that's a capital S there. And so this is not the idea of, well, my spirit was in the right place. They're like, we're all in the same spirit together. Right. This is literally the Holy Spirit we're talking about So here. Let's, let's bring this to a modern day example because uh, this will be touch, This will be a little touchy, but I just want to say it. This, this, what he just said to them as Jews, when he says this and says, you know, that stuff doesn't count. The closest we could come and, and often do come is when we share in first base the significance of baptism by immersion, that mm -hmm. it needs to have those three marks, the right method, the right order, and the right meaning. And what, what we mm -hmm. see play out in someone who is baptized as a baby is that immediately this flurry of emotion 
because that, whether it was a child or a baby, anything that was pre-Christian baptism, here's what they always feel. They always feel like, well, are you saying my baptism didn't count? Are, are you saying that was worthless and meaningless? Are you saying that none of that meant anything? And what, what, what people, because that's the reaction. Meant a lot right? to the parents. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and what we're trying to say is that no, no, it doesn't mean that it's, it's without value. In the same way Paul's saying, he's not saying that the law is without value. was without value. Yeah. <laughs> what he's saying is you have to be incredibly cautious to understand what it means to actually be right with God. And to be right with God is when we do what God says, when God says, with the right heart attitude. Mm -hmm. That's that's what it means to be right with God. So so we have to get beyond the emotion and all my feelings and my thoughts. We have to get beyond that for just a moment and say, wait a minute, is this blinding me to what I'm supposed to do as a next step? Like, is this blinding me, this emotion? It certainly was the Jews. Yeah. Yeah. And, and dear friend, don't let anything blind you to what God is saying for you to do, to take that step. Mm -hmm. Don't let anything stand in the way of that. Once we come to that place where we say, this is, this is what God wants me to do, we simply need to take that next step. And so be careful, be careful of the sin of being religious. Mm -hmm. I know it sounds weird from a preacher to say that, but be careful. That's a horrible place to put yourself. And even if you are a born again believer in Jesus Christ, be careful of backsliding to becoming the older son of the prodigal. Don't fall into that trap. All right, guys, I know you got a lot of fodder for some great discussion. Mm -hmm. We'll see you next time.